Here we go. Good morning, everyone. We'd like to welcome you to our continuing lectures of professional learning with um, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. And uh, we are so happy to have Audrey Warrington from Emporia State University. She's a graduate student in the clinical psychology department. And her topic relates mostly to the area of belonging, so important. And she's, she's looking at different environments uh, of belonging through the eyes of a, a, a college student. And this first one, I will let her tell you more about it to introduce, is on the Appalachian Mountains in the Southeast part of the United States. So welcome, Audrey. We're thrilled to hear what you have to share today. Awesome, thank you, Connie. Um, so my lectures are gonna be more um, personal to my uh, self, kind of how Connie mentioned. Um, and so first I'm going to kind of introduce myself so you guys can get to know me a little bit better um, because also I will be the person in your email constantly. You'll, you'll see my name a lot. Um, but my lectures are gonna be more of like food for thought um, as supplemental lectures that will go along with Connie, Joyce and Martina eventually. Um, and so this, the presentation, it might be confusing at some points of how I might have set it up, but um, I'm going to introduce myself, um, share what I'm speaking on, describe kind of the area so you guys know in the United States about where I'm talking about. Um, then I'm going to finally share why in the world I was there, what I did, and then tie it into diversity and maybe get a few discussion questions out of you guys as well. Um, so like Connie said, I um, am getting my master's in clinical psychology at Emporia State, um, and I'm the graduate research assistant. That's what makes me uh, be here talking to you guys. Let's see, um, some background about myself. I am a cat mom. Um, there he is. His name is Eugene. He's adorable. He might be running around through the screen a few times, um, so just be ready for that. Um, I'm the oldest of three, and I originally grew up in South Alabama, so I kind of know the region a little bit of what I'll be talking about here soon. Um, and then finally, my mom is an educator, and so then that is kind of what uh, helps me figure out and know what you guys are talking about constantly and what uh, Renzulli benefits and lesson plans and stuff, because I've, I've heard that my whole life coming from my mom. She's a special education teacher in the middle school uh, here in Wichita. So, and then speaking of Wichita, I think that's my next slide. Yep. So I am from Wichita, which is smack dab in the middle of the United States. You can see uh, the point there in the middle. Um, Wichita calls ourselves the air capital of the world. Um, I don't know if Italy that means anything or if anybody else in the United States would actually agree with that. But um, that's what our claim to fame is that we like to say for ourselves. Um, and then I also have another job outside of um, GRA in school. So I, I'm a busy girl to say the least. Um, through being a research assistant and some of just the courses that I've taken so far, I found out that I actually love assessment. I love um, kind of getting my hands into the data and, and figuring out what it means. Um, another thing is what will tie what I wanna do and this presentation together is that I am a big advocate for uh, community health. And so that's just like injury, um, violence prevention, mental health, substance abuse, um, things like that. And so then that's, that's kind of where I will lead us into this conversation of um, where I can tie in diversity um, and my own uh, major and focus here. Um, also wanna say that at any point you guys can put um, questions in the chat, I will ask randomly um, if you guys have any questions and then I'll ask it uh, at the very end as well. All right, um, so this is what I will be talking about for the majority of it is Mountaintop. Um, for 45 years, Mountaintop has been in the Grundy County of Tennessee. Uh, they focus on reducing uh, substandard housing supporting lifelong leadership and then just promoting wellness in that area overall. Um, to achieve that goal, they have different camps that they bring out uh, and into the 
Cumberland Plateau area where they have day camps and repair groups. And let me show you where that area is um, after a few stats. Um, so um, the official poverty rate in 2020 in the United States was 11.4 and that went up at an entire percent or 10% um, and from 2019. Um, so you can see that poverty has been rising in the United States. You can see it in uh, 37.2 million um, claims that they were poverty stricken and that is 3.3 million more than 2019. And this is the first significant decline in the median household. So how much income you bring home each year since 2011. Um, so these were stats from a little bit over a year ago at this point, but um, it still is pretty prevalent with, I mean, the pandemic that we all are still going through. And uh, so let me show you the area that I was in. So this is the United States. You can see Tennessee is the state that I'm talking about in the left uh, picture there. Um, the middle picture I got from Google, I wish I would have taken that by myself. Um, it is a beautiful area. And, and the third picture there, um, you can see, so there's Tennessee in red and then there's Chattanooga underneath it. And in that green area that goes up a bit, let's see if I have a cursor, you guys can see my cursor here. That's the Cum Cumberland Plateau and the area that I was in and I will talk about. I was in probably, if you guys can see my blue cursor right around that area um, um, for what I will be talking about. Okay, so what is the environment of the area? Um, it's more of a humid and tropical. Um, there's 56 inches of rain per year. I think that the average I read was about 38 inches a year in the United States. So a significant amount of rain. Um, the summer months the, in Fahrenheit is 84 degrees. So not too hot, honestly, um, in some areas, but the humidity is 90% and above. So that's just, thick air that you actually can feel. Um, the winter months doesn't get too cold either. Um, so that's just the area. Um, we can see it's a beautiful area, tropical area. It doesn't get too hot. But um, so a little bit more about Mountaintop. They offer a mission-based program for youth and adults. Um, and this is, I get kind of like how, why I was there. Um, they help meet physical, spiritual, social, and emotional needs for people that they do encounter. Let's see. Um, next. Okay, so who, who lives in this area? What in the world am I talking about, period? Um, Grundy County competes in being the, poor, the poorest county in the United States. Uh, not something that I would willingly put myself into a competition for. Um, and this is a, when you Google Grundy County who lives there, this was a household that a uh, news channel did a story on that people were claiming that they lived and thrived in this area. Um, so this is a house, uh, five, a family of five lives inside this barn or shack, if you could call it, um, just up in that area. So the population is 14,000. There are seven cities inside of this county. Um, the household income is less than 20,000. Um, and the average income in the United States is about 50,000. Um, so less than 20,000, that's a pretty big deficit there. 30% of the county claims to live in poverty. 10% of the adults have college degrees. Um, however, only 73% of the adults have a high school diploma. Um, this county does not have any hospitals. They don't have a college. There's no retail stores. Um, there's not a dentist. So there's no way for them to actually um, get any help from their environment or their community at any point um, if they didn't have any medical needs or anything. All right, before I go into why in, in the world I'm talking about this and why I was there, does anybody have any questions off the bat? Go through the chat. Okay, so far just a lot of stats to try to get you guys up to pace of what in the world I'm talking about. Awesome, I will keep on keeping on then. 
So why was I there? Um, I was a youth group summer intern at a Methodist church. That's the church in the left-hand corner um, where I just guided different um, volunteer activities. We went to different areas in the United States for mission trips. Um, we went up to, I'll show you the map in a second and I can show you where we went. Um, we went to Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, uh, Tennessee, and then Nebraska for different mission trips. Um, the goal during the summer was to take them to areas of the United States that were maybe affluent and they did have a lot of money coming into the community um, to show that poverty is everywhere and people need help everywhere. Um, and then also um, what I will be talking about is kind of the lowest point that we were at uh, during the summer um, to show them that there are also these areas in the United States that do exist. Um, and these were fun pictures that I took over that summer. Yeah, so here, if you can see my blue cursor, this is where we're from in Kansas. We went down through Texas this way and just kind of did a whole loop up to the Nebraska and back. And then this is Tennessee. So I think it was like a nine hour drive. We all were in vans. So it was, it was a long nine, nine hour drive to say the least. Okay, so these are pictures that I actually took whenever um, we were doing these projects, um, but some, uh, I guess some more stats that the website recorded was 46,229 volunteer hours happened uh, within this organization. 331 families were served and uh, 426 projects were completed. So you can see that some families might've had more than one project that they needed help with. Um, that I put out by nine feeling fine at the bottom because imagine um, any sort of American summer camp that you've ever can seen or imagine, but instead of doing the uh, fun games or maybe like going to the lake or a pool or something like that, we would, um, they literally would have a trumpet that would play over the intercom at 7 a.m. and we'd get us all up, we would get our work attire on, we would have breakfast at seven, then they were we would give it we would be given our assignment and then if we were out by nine we were feeling fine because we were ready for the day we were ready to serve everybody around us with these projects that we were given um so these were two projects that we actually did um i think i'll talk about it a little bit more on my next slide as well but we um first time i've ever used power tools the only time i've ever used power tools um but we actually re-roofed and shingled half of this roof um, over here on the bottom. And then at the top picture, we made an 18 foot ramp off of somebody's house who was in a wheelchair and they weren't able to leave their house at all. Um, so let's see, yeah, physical work. Um, the crazy part about all of it is that we were broken up into these different groups. And so there were 21 states represented during this entire week that came together um we were just kind of split in i think i knew one other person from my church that was in my same group but otherwise we had this was pre-covid of course um different people that were coming in and we had a group of 10 they all were represented from different states um so it's interesting to have to work with these people um, that we've never seen before immediately doing these power tool projects um learning how to communicate with other people um, so we were sent out with these booklets. All we were given were this book that said, these are the tools that we recommend. Um, and we had to bring our own tools. This is the way, this is the way that we think you should build this. Um, good luck. And so we were, we would, we went on um, two one day projects and two two day projects. So the two day projects were the roofing of the, um, the roof and then um, the ramp. And the two one day projects was one day we went inside somebody's house and then cleaned up the outside of their house. Um, they just had a bunch of trash that had accumulated inside and outside their house. And then the second one was this picture here where we kind of redid a couple panelings on the side of the house and then repainted the entire house. I don't have any progress pictures. These are just kind of in the middle of the day pictures. Um, so I can't really show you what we did, but um, just know that it worked and we did it well. Okay, um, so there's how I mentioned at the beginning during the mission statement, 
there were um, the physical needs, the emotional needs, um, and spiritual needs. Um, so the spiritual needs part of it is uh, during lunch, we would um, maybe have devotionals and maybe ask the person of the house that we were serving to participate in devotionals with us or pray with us. Um, but then the hardest part for me, minus never using power tools ever, having to have a learning curve on that point was when we were encouraged to engage and interact with the homeowner. Um, it wasn't that speaking to people is tough for me. It's that you learn really, it's like almost a slap in the face that there is more to poverty than somebody from an affluent area knows about. Um, and so that was kind of the mission, how I said that why we were taking this youth to different areas of the United States was poverty is in affluent areas and then poverty, we do have those areas in the United States that are less than $20,000 of, of an income um, and are living with um, leaky roofs because they can't afford to um, get a new roof of, through insurance or through um, this, that, or the other. Or um, the lady who was in a wheelchair but couldn't leave her house because she didn't have a ramp. Um, it kind of made you think of who is their support system? Do they even have one? Uh, do they have a family outside of the ones who are living in this and this house with them? Um, was their hygiene like their self care? A lot of the people that we worked with didn't have indoor plumbing. Um, they didn't have running water or um, the ability to wash their clothes or anything like that. Um, and then also the the stigma that I'll talk about here in a bit is the mental and physical disabilities that kind of go with poverty um, and everything that surrounds that. So that, that was the toughest part for me was engaging with those people and just kind of seeing that even though that I'm from this, this affluent area in the middle of the United States, you think that we would know, we would know it all. There are just these nook and cranny areas that, um, aren't getting enough from their community period. Um, uh, and I, I think um, the, the best part about the program that we did was they would go out into the community and help these people, but they would only help these people if they were willing to give back to the community, um, which I thought was super cool. Um, so the example that I have um, is we went out to this lady's house and we were we were repairing their roof. We were doing this out of the other for them, but they the way that they were giving back to the community was that they had a bunch of old tires and stuff um, in the back, just taking up room in their backyard. Um, and so what they did was they donated all that to Mountaintop and then Mountaintop uh, broke them up and made them into like mulch for a playground in the, in the community. Um, so that area was, they're, they're helping each other out kind of. And so, I thought that was the coolest part of the entire program that we were a part of. Okay, so then to tie this back to uh, me and what I wanna do is uh, related mental disorders and disabilities. Let me move you guys a bit, there we go. Um, so individuals living in these deprived areas rep report higher levels of mental illness, um, low levels of well being. Um, and this is compared to people who claim to be in affluent areas. Um, I know that stress is a really big factor in um, a lot of the mental illnesses that are diagnosed. And so if you are in a high stress area and you are stressed constantly about maybe where you will live, um, if you will be warm at the end of the night, if you'll get a meal in, your, uh, in, a, in front of you, um, it does attribute to a lot of mental illness. So 23% uh, of men, 26% of women reported to have these mental distress or maybe even psychiatric disorders. Um, so an understatement is this next point of the relationship between mental illness and poverty is complicated. So poverty may intensify the experience of mental illness. Uh, poverty may also increase the likelihood of onset illness, but they're not correlated. Um, Correlation does not always mean causation. That's the biggest thing in the psychology world that I could stress for you guys. Um, and like I said, it's it's stress stress induced mental illness is honestly the majority of disorders that are diagnosed. 
Um, so 9.8 million adults reported being mentally ill in the United States and 25% of those people were underneath the poverty line. So examples of some of these uh, mental illnesses and diagnosis that they were claiming to have or were diagnosed were major depression, bipolar, and schizophrenia. Um, so how mental health leads to addiction. 20% of people in the United States with anxiety, maybe a mood disorder, have also a substance disorder. So along with that um, stress-induced, a lot of the diagnosis for disorders and mental disabilities is the um, abuse of substances, whether that be alcohol, drugs, what have you. Um, often self-medication, using those alcohol and drugs um, is just to numb their physical and psychological pain, but they have um, whatever they have going on in their life. Um, addiction is three times more common with families below the $20,000 income mark. Um, and if you remember from my stats earlier in the presentation, um, that is that um, this area is that $20,000 um, area. Um, so the importance of treatment, community health is so, so important. Um, having those facilities, having the people willing to reach out and help you. Um, again, that's why I loved the organization that we were with, where they were, they were not only helping, willing to help the people in the community, but they were encouraging them to give back to the community. Um, so it wasn't just a stagnant community, that it was a constant flow to eventually maybe make um, the education levels higher or the jobs higher or something. Um, but I think that's why this area was such, um, such an important area to be in was, and especially for community health, because they don't have those hospitals or those dentists or, or, dentists or anything like that. So um, just this organization in that area is really big for this community. Um, my last point is mental health and addiction are heavily stigmatized in the United States. Um, and that's kind of goes back to the relationship between mental illness and poverty is it's so complicated. Um, if you just go off of stigmas and not off of research and knowing, knowing diagnoses and mental illnesses. Okay, so to tie this in to uh, diversity, what this week is for everybody um, in this study, um, I found a, a definition online that kind of encompasses everything that I could imagine uh, diversity to be, um, but it's not limited to. Um, so the range of human differences, including but not limited to race, um, ethnicity, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, age, social class, physical abilities, attributes, religion, um, ethical values, national origin, even political beliefs. Um, so the, the point that I took from this diversity week inside of this study that we do um, is I touched maybe a little bit on age, social class, physical abilities, um, maybe even ethical values. Um, but like I said, this is just a small supplemental presentation um, for my own life that I took. Um, and my presentation is not limited to anything else. It is inside this definition and maybe not even inside this definition. Okay, so last at the beginning of the presentation, I warned you guys that I was gonna have discussion questions. Um, I tried to tie this more into uh, maybe the classrooms that you guys would see. Um, these questions can either be food for thought for you guys. You can write them down by yourselves. You can throw them into the chat. You can um, turn off your mic and speak. But um, the two questions that I have for you guys are, how do you address uh, stigmas in your life, classroom, maybe your, the workspace? Um, and does diversity affect your classrooms? Like I said, you guys um, can speak out loud. We can have a discussion. Um, if you do have any questions about anything else, um, I'm open to questions about anything as well.
I, I have a question for you. This is Connie. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, um, could you give us a little bit of a time frame on when you were in Appalachia and um, if you've uh, remained in contact with any of those individuals since then, or, uh, you know, how is time, you, you know, it, it sounds like it was an adjustment and there were some things you learned uh, because you were there. So um, what, what do you know now as a result of, uh, especially that relates to belonging, what kinds of, um, how did members of the society in Appalachia know they were secure and belong to their community? And I guess this is two questions. So as it relates to belonging, but also what have you learned about that as you've had more time to reflect since you've been there? Yeah. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we'll break it apart, but um... That was a, a big year for me after going to that um, summer camp and a lot of the other places that we went that summer. Um, I actually almost dropped out of college that I could pursue something like that because it was so heavy on my heart um, and something that I wanted to pursue and help the community of people. Um, but then I decided to take a different, a different route, obviously, to be that person inside of the community health facilities um, rather than promoting them, which I could still promote while inside. Um, but um, the summer after uh, this is when COVID hit. So a lot of the, the places did shut down. That camp actually, I think, just now reopened. And so they were doing very small groups that would kind of help the community as much as they could in a safe way. Um, my church that I was a youth, um, youth intern with, I still do things with them today. Um, and then even in the community here in Emporia, Kansas, I'm a part of like Habitats of Humanity and um, different community service opportunities that giving back to your community is just such a heavy topic on my heart and um, the people around us. So I don't know, I've, I've tried to stick with that as much as I could even through the pandemic of maybe organizations limiting access to volunteers and such if that answered at least one of your questions. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, does anyone else uh, have questions for Audrey? Uh, uh, we have Joyce Miller with us now, and I would like to take this opportunity to remind you and invite you to the lecture on Saturday. Uh, it would be at the same time on Saturday, and Dr. Miller will, uh, we're, we're glad to um, have her share on the topic of diversity. And that's a broad topic, but it's one that she has, uh, has a wealth of experience and knowledge and um, insight uh, into. So we we'll hope that you will be able to join us on Saturday, uh, it'd be 12 o'clock central time. And uh, I guess that would be 17 hours in Italy, uh, or five o'clock is, I think that's right, isn't it, uh, Martina? Five o'clock in Italy on Saturday? Seven. Seven, Seven yeah. o'clock. Uh, okay, so, uh, so, so we're looking forward to that. Uh, we will uh, go ahead and conclude unless there are other questions. Is there anybody that, um, uh, you know, this will be posted on the YouTube channel once it's uh, processed, we'll go ahead and post that up there for you or for anybody that wasn't able to see it today and all of the lectures are posted there. So, um, okay, well then uh, Joyce, is there anything that you would like to add uh, about your lecture on Saturday, Martina? Uh, anything else you would like to say before we close? Well, good morning, everyone. A good uh, early afternoon, everyone. I, um, I really would like to take a little bit different approach to presentation for Saturday and talk about some uh, terms and some issues that we've heard a lot about, if you know much about, and I'd like to just uh, put 
critical race theory on the table along with the 1619 project and just provide a little bit of illumination concerning those two topics. Well, that's, that's a hot topic these days. So uh, thank you, Joyce, for that. Okay, Martina, any last words? Uh, any last qu any questions from our people in Italy? Okay, eh, buonasera a tutti. A tutte, se avete qualche domanda eh, su quello che avete ascoltato, sull'esperienza eh, di Audrey che ha fatto in questa comunità, insomma, di, eh, di poveri e lei si è occupata sia di, di un aiuto concreto, manuale, nel riparare, insomma, il tetto e altre cose, sia proprio dare un supporto eh, emotivo ma anche spirituale. E non lo so se avete qualche domanda eh, per Audrey e, e dopo nell'ultima nell parte della presentazione ha fatto un po', ha dato una definizione così di diversità, ma sarà poi approfondita dalla professoressa Miller sabato. Well, thank you everyone. I'm going to go ahead and close and we'll hope to see you all on Saturday or during one of our other lectures very soon. Have a great rest of the day.